Good evening. I'm Karen Taylor, Programme Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. And I'm so pleased to welcome you all here this evening um, to tonight's talk, which is part of the Labour, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series and is part, and is part of our summer lectures. Um, programme is presented in partnership with the New York Landmarks Conservancy. And I would like to express our huge appreciation to them for all their help. For those of you who may be less familiar with uh, the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society uh, was founded in 1785 by 22 artisans. Um, we are a nonprofit organization um, that continues to serve and improve the quality of life of the people of New York City through our various educational and cultural programs. These include um, our tuition free mechanics institutes, our 200 year old um, General Society Library, our John M. Mossman Lock Museum, and finally, our lecture series a series that actually started in 1837. So we're very proud to continue that tradition. Uh, regards this evening, just uh, uh, some uh, practical details. Please feel free to submit type questions throughout the lecture uh, through the Q&A section. And of course, at the conclusion of the talk, we would ask that you use the Q&A section rather than raise your hand. Now it is, such a pleasure to welcome here this evening, Sarah Cedar Miller, to discuss the story of two and a half centuries of the history of Central Park. Sarah Cedar Miller was a Central Park Conservancy photographer from 1984 and the historian from 1989 to 2017. She is now historian emirata of the Conservancy her photographs have been distributed worldwide and she's appeared on behalf of the Conservancy on radio, TV and many documentaries. She gives specialized tours and lectures on Central Park's history and art. She is the author of Central Park, an American masterpiece, Strawberry Fields, Central Park's memorial to John Lennon, Seeing Central Park, the official guidebook updated and expanded. And of course, the book she's here to talk about to tonight, Before Central Park. And I'm actually, you know, delighted to say that tonight, today is the official debut and publication date. So many congratulations on that. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce to you, Sarah Cedar Miller. A very warm welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I'd like to thank you, um, Meg Oliver and Angelo Vigorito, for the honor of speaking before you tonight through the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York and the New York Landmarks Conservancy for giving me this opportunity to share stories from my new book, Before Central Park. As you will see in the talk, several members of the General Society had a role in Central Park's prehistory. The research was a seven year odyssey, including my time spent at the society's library, but I must also credit the Central Park Conservancy, which has always been involved in all aspects of the park and pre-park history. And many of its findings are included in the book. Before Central Park focuses on two and a half centuries of social and military history, also taking into account the millennia of use by indigenous peoples and the eons of the land's physical history. But it would be impossible to discuss with you every aspect of it. So instead, I have chosen to tell you five stories that represent different aspects of the pre-park history. The book is divided into three sections, topography, real estate, and the idea of a park. Of course, Central Park did not exist as an entity 
until 1853. For almost two centuries before that, the 843 acre site was situated at the confluence of three distinct districts, Harlem, Bloomingdale, and Yorkville, most of it also known as the common lands. They are seen here on the left of the screen, superimposed on a current map of the park. Topography is destiny. The configuration of physical features on the land has always determined their social history. Where the land favored cultivation and human habitation, it was settled. Where it was challenging and inhospitable, people neither lived there or invested in it. The terrain at the north end of the park, today's Harlem Mere, which you can see on your screen, and its surrounding landscapes, both inside the park and adjacent to it, had a very favorable topography that was unique to Manhattan Island, and it saw over two centuries of settlement. And it is to one of those stories that we now turn. Our Harlem story starts with the Wisquazjek Trail created by the local Anape to navigate from their Bronx encampments to those at the tip of Manhattan Island in the South. To get there, they had to find a path of leaf, least resistance from the hundreds of hills and thousands of rock outcrops so prevalent throughout the terrain. On this map, you can see in aligned in black is the park and here is the Native American trail, the Lenape trail that goes into the park at about 110th street and out at about 92nd street. With the, it exited at Fifth Avenue and 92nd street and headed to Third Avenue and then downtown. During the Dutch era, the trail became a wagon road. And when the English conquered the colony after 1664, the highway became known as the King's Bridge Road, so-called as the bridge from the Bronx to Manhattan collected a toll imposed by one of the King's loyal subjects. Its original surface was comprised of millions of small compacted stones and was surprisingly discovered in 2003 when the Central Park Conservancy was working in the area. The larger flat stones that you see in the foreground supported a fortification that was only constructed and put in place in 1814. In the mid 18th century, that narrow opening in the wall of rock that crossed the park at 106th Street, basically, became known as McGowan's Pass, named for the family that owned the land. Today, it's a lovely path like many others in the park, but do not be fooled. McGowan's Pass is one of the most significant spots in the history of New York City. In this photo, you can see the narrow pass. It's a walkway in the park, plus not too much on each side, and two rock outcrops. So this is the only break in the wall of rock that crossed the park and even crossed further into Manhattan. During both the Dutch and English colonial periods, taverns for locals and travelers dotted the Kingsbridge Road from the Bronx to the Battery. The McGowan family operated a tavern along the road from 1756 to the Revolutionary War in 18, in, sorry, in 1776. And it's approximately at about 105th, 104th Street today near the East Drive. And in order to set the stage for the historic event that took place at the tavern, we need to time travel back to September 7th, 1776, when General George Washington and thousands of his mainly untrained rebel troops found themselves on Manhattan Island, surrounded by 34,000 British and Hessian troops aboard 427 ships. As the ships were sailing up both rivers, 
the burning question on Washington's mind was to stay and tough it out or to abandon New York. New York City was the most strategically important city that connected the colonies, the Hudson River to Canada, and the port to Europe. Holding it would mean almost certain victory for either side. On September 7th, at his headquarters in today's West Village, Washington and his generals held a council of war meeting. This drawing isn't necessarily at that mansion that Washington had as his headquarters, but it stands to reason that this is more or less what, what uh, generals get together and look at maps and discuss their strategy. Both psychologically and ethically, Washington was duty bound to an 18th century code of honor, which included bravery, willpower, and moral rectitude. And under that code, he would stand his ground, persevere, even die, rather than abandon New York. A few generals considered burning down the city so that the British troops would not have winter quarters. But the Continental Congress in Philadelphia forbade it and advised them to stay and hold the city. Five days later, after a failed attempt at a peace conference on Staten Island, the situation worsened. Washington agreed to convene another council of war meeting as his generals begged him to do. The location of the September 12th meeting has rarely been revealed, but we know it was held at the McGowan Tavern temporarily the headquarters of General Alexander McDougall on the, on the right, who was assigned there to protect the pass and the road. Although it was poor form to rescind a military decision, nine of the 12 generals present, including McDougall, voted to evacuate Lower Manhattan with only three generals dissenting, including General William Heath, here on the left. McDougal was a hot-headed Scotsman who hated Heath, whom he considered pompous and hypocritical, especially because of his vote to stay and not evacuate Manhattan Island. We know about the location of the Secret Council of War meeting because McDougal let the cat out of the bag six years later. In 1782, the two men found themselves stationed together at West Point. Heath was McDougall's superior officer. One evening in January, 1782, during what McDougall later called a social hour and perhaps aided by some strong drink, he revealed Heath's vote to a group of officers. As a result, Heath discharged McDougall from his command placed him under arrest and charged him with seven counts of conduct unbecoming an officer. Many months later at his court martial, McDougall was found guilty of revealing the secret meeting, which greatly angered General Washington, who was otherwise quite fond of General McDougall. At 11 a.m. on September 15th, three days after the meeting, the British attacked New York at Kipps Bay at 34th Street. Washington had moved his headquarters to the Morris Mansion, now the Morris Jumel Mansion in Harlem. He raced down the Kingsbridge Road, past the McGowan's Tavern to reach his terrified troops who were deserting. He drove them west to Times Square and then north on the Bloomingdale Road, now Broadway. While the Americans went up the west side, the British went up the east side on the Kingsbridge Road. Some of the generals occupied McGowan's Tavern that night, as well as another local tavern on 96th Street in the Pre Park. Today, the site of Mrs. McGowan's Tavern is used as the park's composting area, an important aspect of the Conservancy's horticultural operations. Earlier in the talk, I noticed 
noted that topography was destiny. Where the land was poor, it was undesirable and as such owned by the city of New York since the Dutch era. That all changed by the end of the 18th century when real estate trumped topography as the determining factor for both settlement and investment. After the revolution, New York was bankrupt with barely any power to tax its citizens. Its only asset was the vast waste, as they called it waste, common lands known as Yorkville that ran from 23rd Street North and included much of the Upper East Side. The city divided its vast real estate holdings into five acre lots in 1796. The dotted area was a great portion of what became Central Park. The city sold the green lots and held on to the yellow lots as rental properties until the neighboring lots were sufficiently improved to raise the purchase price on the alternate lots. These are photographs that show the pre-parks barren and fetid swamps rock outcrops and glacial boulders that covered the uneven terrain. One New Yorker, James Amory, bought his first common lands lot because his family living downtown had been stricken with the mosquito-borne yellow fever in the fall of 1797. Like the recent COVID epidemic, it was thought that the disease was contagious so no one could come near the family and Amory, who fortunately remained healthy himself, was forced to nurse his wife and children by himself. Most well-to-do New Yorkers left town every autumn, the fever season, and Amory regretted not doing so. The following year, he bought his first common land lot. He soon bought out many of his neighbors, both within the pre-park and east of Fifth Avenue. Some of the park's most beloved landscapes were on James Amory's farm. The Mall, Bethesda Terrace, Cherry Hill, the Dean, and parts of the East Green and Sheep Meadow, they all belong to James Amory. But James Amory was not just a farmer. He was also, like his father, John Amory, a maker of elite sporting goodwear, especially celebrated for their branded horse whips. In 1805, Amory moved his whip business and his apprentices from downtown to his farm in the pre park. I wanted to find a whip made by James or John Amory. And after surfing the web, I finally found this elegant riding crop with the name Amory inscribed in silver and the initials GW on its handle, on the tip of its handle. It was owned by none other than George Washington, the country's most celebrated equestrian. And the riding crop is the pride of the Mount Vernon collection. This particular horsewhip, because of its date, could have been made by either John Amory or his son James. John is important to us here because he was a member of the General Society, having joined in 1790. Two years later, he and his wife hosted the anniversary meeting of the General Society at their tavern adjacent to City Hall that Mrs. Amory had owned with her first husband. We now travel west to a section of Bloomingdale that ran from the Hudson River to the common lands. Because of its spectacular location on the Hudson River, Bloomingdale became an enclave for the rich elite of New York. By the early, in the, in the 18th century, by the early 19th century, the landowners as a rule became well-to-do members of the merchant and artisan class. Samuel Stilwell, a grocer turned surveyor and a gentleman farmer, owned a large portion of the Upper West Side in the West 80s from the Hudson River to the common lands at 7th Avenue. 
1811, brothers Benjamin and Thomas de Milt purchased a portion of this land, and in particular, the highest point in Central Park West at 83rd Street, that's still well called Mount Prospect for the beautiful views of the highlands and the river and the Palisades. Today, we call it Summit Rock. From there, one could enjoy the views, but why would anyone have spent $2,000 for a massive rock outcrop? That was the question I wanted to answer. The brothers, the DeMilts, were celebrated watchmakers and silversmiths. Here on the left is a watch paper that would have been inserted into every watch they made or sold. It's very small. It's the size of like an inch, an inch and a half. They were also the first Americans to sell British made nautical chronometers and astronomical clocks as the one seen on the right. The chronometer revolutionized sea travel in the Atlantic world. The ability to predict and guarantee a ship's course, the device remade world commerce exploration and save countless lives from shipwrecks or scurvy. Watchmakers relied on astronomical observatories, generally sited on high altitudes with access to dark skies to assess the precision of their chronometers. If the instrument passed these exacting tests, it would be certified and valued as an observatory chronometer. I propose that the DeMilts purchased Summit Rock for its altitude, its remote location, as a perfect place for an astronomical observatory. By 1818, Benjamin and Samuel DeMilt established DeMilt's Longitude Observatory, but it was located above their downtown shop on Pearl Street, as you can see in this advertisement. But they may have planned for a more extensive one in Central Park. Just to, as an aside, one of the more hidden gems of the park are these beautiful steps that the designers of the park, Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Fox, carved into Summit Rock. It's just above the Diana Ross Playground above 81st Street, and uh, you can climb it to reach the top. It's one of the little kind of secret out of the way places in the park. The DeMilts are important to us here because Benjamin joined the General Society in 1826 and became its vice president. He bequeathed his library of 1833 volumes to be used and improved as a pay library. In 1831, Benjamin gave $250 for the reading room. In 1853, his I don't know whether they're daughters or sisters, but Elizabeth DeMilt do donated $5,000 for the library and Sarah DeMilt $2,000. In 1825, the DeMilt's property was adjacent to what we know today as Seneca Village, the largest African-American property owning community in New York and possibly in the country. Let's see if I can use my cursor here. I hope you can see this would be the DeMilt's property. Here is Summit Rock. And here is the future, this green and yellow and green again border of what would become Seneca Village. But in order to understand the history of the community, I wanted to find out about John and Elizabeth Whitehead, the white couple who sold their land, some historians say farm, to members of the black community. John Whitehead purchased these 18 acres of Stillwell's original farm in 1824. He never lived there, nor did he farm there. He was a licensed cart man, seen here, the official cart man's uniform of a white smock and a black top hat. It was considered a prestigious profession held exclusively by white men who most often had
held nativist and racist views. But Whitehead was different, an outlier from the other cart men. I had the honor of meeting with Graham Russell Hodges, the leading authority on cart men and one of the leading authorities on black history of New York. He considered Whitehead to be an outlier. Additional research showed that Whitehead was also quite wealthy, lived on Orchard Street, and most likely held progressive religious views that believed in eternal salvation for all people, not just those of a prescribed religion. Though the city was filled with greedy speculators, Whitehead sales to the black community strongly suggest otherwise. Just like today or before the internet, when one wanted to sell real estate, they would place ads in newspapers. But then Whitehead purchased the site. My research found no such ads suggesting a prior arrangement or agreement between him and the black community. Furthermore, after purchasing the land, Whitehead hired a surveyor to divide it into 200 lots and began to sell them exclusively to members of the black community. After his death in 1835, Whitehead's widow and daughter followed suit selling only to black community with only one exception. Time constraints prevent me from discussing all the research I've done on Seneca Village or that others have done that is featured in the book. So I'll offer only a few aspects of it here and try to answer some longstanding questions that we've all had. The name Seneca Village has confounded historians since the community was first brought to our attention by historians Roy Rosenzweig and Elizabeth Blackmar in their 1992 book, The Park and the People. In chapter 17 of my book, I offer a possible explanation for it, which is a little too long and complicated to go into, but I hope you'll buy the book and read it. Yet my research made one thing perfectly clear. I could not find even one mention of the name Seneca Village in the contemporary personal or public record. No legal document, letter, deed, diary, will, court case, map, tax record, newspaper article, classified ad, real estate ad, government report, or annual report by the commissioners of Central Park ever mentioned the term for the 32 years of the community's existence. It is almost certain that the name was exclusively called such by outsiders to the community and never by a landowner, renter, mortgagee, mortgagor, mortgage document, petitioner, or descendant of the village landowners. At its peak in 1855, the year this map was created, the community had approximately 200 residents living in about 50 dwellings. It was the most densely populated area of the park with one exception. The Sisters of Charity of Mount St. Vincent that were on the composting, what would now be the composting area, and it's why we call the composting area the Mount because the Sisters of Charity of Mount St. Vincent had been there from 1846 onward, 48 onward. The landowners of Seneca Village were predominantly black and the renters were black, Irish, or German. The most significant findings revealed more than 100 transfers of property that were held during the life of the community, proof that real estate investment and capital gains were not exclusive to white New Yorkers. Evidence shows that land ownership in Seneca Village changed hands frequently and as such became a significant vehicle for black empowerment and enrichment through the buying and selling of real estate. As author Carla Peterson, great granddaughter of Seneca Village landowners, Joseph and Elizabeth Marshall wrote in her book, in her book Black Gotham, about the black middle class, quote, just as much as personal income 
land was a good investment to be bought and sold for a profit, end quote. Between the years 1829 and 1836, one third of Whitehead's buyers sold their land and homes all for a profit during the great financial boom of the period. Most often, they sold to other Black families, adding to their existing property or new buyers wishing to join the community, make a good investment, and gain the right to vote. Black men with property were able to vote starting in 1777, right in the middle of the revolution. But after the um, New York State Convention of 1821, the only Black men who owned property assessed at $250 were given the privilege. White men, of course, had no suffrage restrictions decided in that convention. In the financial panic of 1837 that followed the real estate boom, several landowners lost their property and then lost their job, sorry, several landowners lost their jobs and then lost their property due to mortgage foreclosure or unpaid assessments. Their properties were then absorbed by the mortgagees, the people who had given the, the owners a mortgage. Generally, they were white investors who had given them the mortgage. In the early 1850s, several black owners also sold out to white speculators just before the idea for Central Park took place. Many of the Seneca Village landowners did not live in the community, but owned or rented homes downtown. For the most part, they were the leaders in both the social and political community. Albro Lyons on the left and his brother, Peter Guignon on the right, brother-in-law, Peter Guignon on the right, met as students at the African Free School, the most advanced educational opportunity for black children in New York. Lyons and Guignon had ownership of their Seneca Village lots through their wives, whose parents had purchased the property. Yet, even though the wives inherited the property from their parents, it was the husbands who legally owned it. Until the, married, <clears throat> until the Married Women's Property Act was passed in 1848, it was a radical movement for New York State, only the husband of a married couple could own the property, even if his wife owned it or inherited it prior to the marriage, unless they had a prenup or it was spelled out in the deed itself. Several black religious leaders also bought or rented land in Seneca Village. Just like Albro Lyons, the reverends Charles B. Ray left and Theodore S. Wright center both had homes that were downtown stops on the Underground Railroad. There is a very strong possibility that they might have been planning to have one in Seneca Village as well. Reverend James N. Gloucester on the right was also their associate and an activist for civil rights and most likely also harbored fugitive enslaved people in his Brooklyn home or church. But it was Gloucester's activist wife, Elizabeth, a wildly successful entrepreneur who stands out in the story. She began her real estate career by purchasing two lots in Seneca Village, one of them on the site of this beautiful cherry tree LA on the west side of the reservoir. Elizabeth's life is a fascinating one that is told in the book and at her death, in 1883, she was one of the richest black women in America. Here is an example of her business acumen and foresight. When she received her award for her Seneca Village property in 1856, she used some of it to buy a lot near Fifth Avenue and 98th Street near the future Central Park, knowing full well that it would prove to be an outstanding investment which it was for her. The history of becoming Central Park takes up the third section of the book from the first conception for a large municipal park in the 1840s through to the taking of the last four blocks of the park in 1863. 
one of the most burning questions that people had, myself included, was how much each landowner received for their property from the city. And even more importantly, was the award of the money fair market value? According to Article 5 of the US Constitution, a governmental agency could take property through eminent domain as long as the owner received, quote, just compensation, end quote, determined by the courts as a fair market value. In 1856, the city paid over $5 million for the land from 59th Street to 106th Street, including the common land, much of it still owned by the city. I desperately wanted the information and searched every archive to find the releases to the owners. But it was always the same polite apology. Sorry, we just don't have those papers. One day surfing the web, I found a 1901 report listing every archive and record in the state of New York and the city of New York by noted historian Herbert L. Osgood. And after hours of mind numbing scrolling, there it was on page 111, underlined in red, quote, seven volumes relating to the expenditures for Central Park, 1856 to 1858, end quote. Bingo, I found it. The records did exist, but where were they now? Unfortunately, this precious information did not help in my search, but I knew the volumes had to be somewhere. And we can jump ahead to September 2017, when up popped an email from my good friend, genealogist Aaron Goodwin, the author of a book on the holdings of the municipal archives. The email included a photograph of the seven missing volumes found in the Brooklyn storehouse of the municipal archives. Did I want to see them, Aaron asked. Here is one page from Seneca Village landowner Elizabeth McCollin, who received $1,550 for her property. 810 was for her two-story home and shed, and 740 for her lot, which lay along 86th Street considered by the surveyors as an avenue which was assessed at a higher value. The lot awards were plotted onto a grid and the determining factors seem consistent with the real estate mantra, location, location, location. Lots close to the developing city, those at 59th Street, were the most valuable. Lots fronting an avenue or along 86th Street were worth more. Avenue lots between 5th and 6th Avenue were slightly longer lots, contributing to their higher value. Lots and homes in the middle of the blocks were valued less than those on the avenues. Neither topography, nor the condition of the property, nor the owner's financial, social status, race, or nationality seems to have been a deciding factor. Location of the property determined the size of the award, the closer to the developing city downtown, the higher the payment. The most valued, valuable properties were on 59th Street and those in the 60s. The least valued were lots at the north end at 106th Street. There are so many stories and histories that I did not have time to share with you today, but I hope you'll read the book. Also look out for my website, beforecentralpark.com, where I will be continuing my research, inform you of book-related issues, events, and tours, and feature guest bloggers, or contact me with questions. The lecture tonight is just one of the General Society's programs. And if you enjoyed, please consider a donation to the organization. And of course, we at the Central Park Conservancy would also love it if you would join us as well. Thank you again 
for this wonderful opportunity to share my research with you tonight. And in the time left, I am happy to answer your questions. Sarah, thank you so much. That was absolutely tremendous. And I know it's just a tiny part of the massive research and writing that you have done in this magnificent book. And I want to so warmly recommend this fantastic book to all our audience watching tonight. It really is utterly tremendous. Um, so thank you for speaking here. Now we will take um, some questions, um, but before we do, um, Victoria, uh, is, there, uh, is there something you would like to say before we start the Q&A? Victoria Dengel, our executive director. Sarah, thank you, that was wonderful. And thank you for acknowledging our General Society members and for acquainting us in an even deeper way with the park that we all love. Your book is exquisite. And I, I was looking through it and all of your beautiful images. I mean, one was more beautiful than the other, but I don't think my words could, could suffice. So I wanna read what Kenneth Jackson had to say because I think it captured it all. Central Park is the most important and influential urban park space in the world, public space in the world, excuse me. But what did its 843 acres look like before Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vaux performed their magic? Sarah Cedar Miller has given us the answer and so much more. The illustrations are beautiful the prose rolling and imaginative, the research thorough and the result splendiferous. And that was Kenneth T. Jackson, editor in chief of the Encyclopedia of New York City. So it's a beauty, thank you. Yeah, here, here, really, an absolutely fantastic book. Um, so we will start um, by taking some questions, but Sarah, if you don't mind, I, I will maybe um, ask you the first one. The, um, the research, I mean, obviously you did massive research, but the books you turned up, the, um, the volumes that indicated what the cost of the various plots were, had anyone, has anyone ever, ever published information relating to that before? No, uh, you know, they're in the park and the people, they had some source that, that one sentence said, um, almost everyone made money, but they didn't uh, actually elaborate on it. So I, with the help of a mathematician, Andy Fox, actually we sat down, I'm, I can barely add two and two, so um, I needed help. But he and I took, I, I had from those books, all of um, the money that the uh, landowners got and actually some renters got it because in the city, if you rented, rented, what it meant was you were renting the land and you would build your own house. And so when the city took the land from you or bought it from you, uh, if you were a renter, but you had built your house, they would reimburse you as well. Huh. So, um, you know, there, there was a lot of uh, uh, math to do. But it all it all laid out, you know, we laid it out on a grid and sure enough, it was all about location. Right. And I'm going to actually ask a, a follow up question from uh, one of our attend attendees. Uh, so you you indicated the price so it was dictated by location, but was it also fair market value. That is a great question and I can give one. Um, one instance, the Elizabeth uh, Gloucester, who I mentioned, who turned her award around and bought another lot near Central Park, um, it was the same amount. I think ten, there was a $10 discrepancy. I think she got $450 for her property on 88th Street on the west side, and she bought for $450 same size property right off 98th and 99th street on the east side which was also more valuable so there seems to be a parity uh from what she received 
to what she also purchased. And that means that it was fair market value. I mean, I, one would have to do a huge amount of research in order to do it. But her, her instance and a few others um, seem to prove that the city had done what it could. That is, that is very good. That's very good to hear. Um, I, I also want to mention to the audience, I did notice a couple of people had raised their hands. If you wouldn't mind submitting your question and typing it in, that would be great. But here is the, um, another question from our audience, and this is from Stephen Marmon. Uh, you briefly wrote about Dan Sickles, the notorious politician and general in your marvelous book. While he really wasn't the founder of the park as he claimed, do you think his efforts to get the commissioner's report and the funding approved allows one to say he played a key role in the park's creation? Okay, that is, I love the story of Sickles. Um, I didn't mention him, but he's more well known as um, both a state senator and a general in uh, Gettysburg. Uh, but he actually was a park advocate and he saw politically that nothing was happening. Um, to me, the one thing that rang true was the fact that um, Judge Ira Harris of Albany was um, brought down because of Sickles to oversee the um, hearing to make Central Park official because no other judge in the city would touch it. It was a hot political potato. No one wanted to deal with it. Uh, and so the park came very narrowly to not existing because it, the, city needed in, the city needed the state court in order to approve the, the report of the surveyors. So um, Sickles maneuvered his way to get Judge Ira Harris without him really knowing it to um, come into the um, New York, to spend time in New York. I mean, it's a really very funny story is how he convinces his, his wife and his daughters, um, Harris's wife and daughters to come and uh, have a gay time in, in New York while Judge Harris is sitting on what they thought was an overcrowded court, which it was, but that wasn't the reason Sickles brought Harris down to the city. And, you know, it, no one else had written about it. Um, he wrote about this in a, in a report that's in the Library of Congress when he was old in his, I guess, 90s. But it smacks of the kind of deception and chicanery that he was capable of. And, you know, I should also mention that he was, had murdered um, Philip Scott Key, Francis Scott Key, who wrote the uh, Star Spangled Banner. He, he shot his... Um, his son in cold blood on a street in Washington because he found out that he was his wife's lover. So he was quite a colorful character. Um, he also robbed the US post office. So, you know, I would put anything past him. But he could be said to pay a small part in Central Park's creation. I think he paid a large right. part. Good. Without that okay. judge, without that judge, right? nothing would have happened. Well. Good, good to know. Um, this is from Abby Heller, and she, and she thanked you for the presentation. Now, she wonders, while there are no known record of Seneca Village, but is it possible the name originated um, by Native Americans? That is a question that people have been asking. Uh, the Seneca uh, people were upstate New York, um, near Rochester, that's where they still are, that's Seneca County. Um, in chapter 17, I give a whole story of why Seneca would have been a county, the county of Seneca would have been played a part in the name. Uh, it's very long and complicated. I, I um, will only say, please read the chapter because it, it really explains how you, it's, there are so many um, steps you have to go through to understand my thinking on why I put the name Seneca Village to Egbert Vile, who designed, um, is the first designer of Central Park. But I, I do believe that it smacks of 
a very strong plausibility that this is why the name came about. So less, less about Seneca the people than about Seneca the county, which of course did take its name from the indigenous people, but I don't think specifically it was about indigenous people more than the name of a county that had an indigenous people's name to it. I hope that explains it. It's, it's a little complicated. It was really hard to break it down to write about. And I think that you, you comprehensively explained it. And as you mentioned, it was a chapter seven, you said, was that? Seven, the, uh, 17. Chapter 17 uh, will provide more, in, uh, more information on that. Um, and also we have another Seneca village question, and this is for someone she, uh, her name, uh, Sarah Marsh, she missed a few details and she wanted to, if, if you wouldn't mind repeating Sarah, um, was Seneca village within the footprint of what is now Central Park? And, and again, if you would say a little bit more about how did the eminent domain work to enable the city fathers to build the park? Okay. Yes, all of Seneca Village was in the footprint of Central Park. Basically, um, if you go there today, the Central Park Conservancy has done a wonderful exhibit. Uh, there are many different sign, signs that you walk through the landscape and it can really, it takes you to pretty much the, the um, whole area that in, includes today, part of the reservoir, um, part of the West Meadow up in um, the 90s, late late 80s, almost to the 90s, but Seneca Village went from 83rd Street to 89th Street, but not Central Park West, halfway between 7th, what would be 7th Avenue, basically the west side of the Great Lawn and Central Park West. So it was about, um, I forget whether it was 17 or 18 acres, but it was um, long, and, long and skinny um, and, and fairly flat and um, not too much rock outcrop, which the lower park had much more rock outcrop in it. Uh, so can you remind me of the second part uh, of the It was question? about uh, uh, eminent domain. domain. Yes, how, how, did it, okay. how did it work to enable the city holders to build it? Well, in order to take the land, the city, uh, actually the state, had to appoint um, commissioners of assessment and estimate. And the commissioners hired four city surveyors and it took over two years for them to go to each plot, assess it, write it up, give it a value, give the home a value, if there was a home, a shed, give the shed a value. Many, many um, lots had, had um, gardens, although I don't think they were figured into the assessment, but then they, were, they assessed it and then they had to go to, um, the commissioners had put out uh, the uh, uh, amount and the petitioners and the people came to um, the office, I think it was in City Hall, to look at how much, you know, there was no email. So you had to go to City Hall and look at the list to see how much um, the city was willing to give you. And then if you didn't like it, then you would um, petition. And um, there are seven volumes or really six volumes of petitions um, from the people, from the landowners, um, I forget what percentage of landowners complained, but it was um, it was uh, about a quarter of the landowners. I can't remember now, I'm sorry. But at any rate, um, you petitioned, then you went to the hearing in front of Judge Harris, and then it was Judge Harris, who we now know came from Dan Sickles, who pronounced it um, a report, he read the report, gave his pronouncement that's also more detail in the book and uh, you know decided that the surveyors were fair and that it was of fair market value and uh, not that many people complained that was one of his um, factors that was a deciding factor for him 
and he pronounced it a park on February 5th, eight, uh, 1856. What I should say is that um, in 1853, when the city, uh, when the um, state decided to take the land, they had estimated that the land for Central Park, remember it only went up to 106th Street at that point, they estimated that the land would only cost $1.5 million, which was a huge amount of money then. And a lot of people were you know, hesitant. Nonetheless, they went through. And when the commissioners, uh, surveyors, did the, uh, surveyed the land in their two-year assessment, it all totaled over $5 million. And that you know, freaked New Yorkers out. They were like, what? You promised it was only going to cost 1.5 million, but the land had increased in value so much, the speculation and the way um, the city was growing, the land became really valuable and tripled in, in value. And so now the park wasn't gonna cost 1.5 million, it was going to cost Five, uh, five million, and many people said, forget the park. It would, don't, we don't want it. This is gonna cost the taxpayers way too much money. And that is why even the people who wanted more, whether it was truly valuable, valued as they had written in their petition, they knew that they wouldn't have a park if they had to um, increase uh, the awards. So that's, um, that's a part of an important part of the story is the fact that um, in the, sit, the city had um, originally, or, or the state, one, one price and three and a half years later, it was a huge, huge price. I hope I've answered the you, question. You absolutely have. And of course, because um, our audience are New Yorkers and have a active and interest in real estate uh, people are wondering if you could a uh, couple we've had a couple of questions relating to that of what i've been doing from jeffrey baldwin what are the what what do you think if you want to give one example of one of the pots that were sold what the historic value if inflated to 2022 would you give a guesstimate on that on the value uh, yes the historic i i think mr baldwin is asking you know, maybe a plot, if it went for $460, oh. then what might it be worth now in 2022? Well, uh, you know, I have looked it up, things like that a million times, but here's where you can find the answer, where I found the answers to these types of um, calculations, measuringworth.com. It's the best website and it's really done so well. Uh, I'll say it again, measuring www.measuringworth, all one word, dot com. And you put in a value and the year, and you put in the year you want to know the value, which would be um, 2022, and up comes your answer. It's, right. it's okay. amazing. Okay, very, very good to know. Um, I see that it is, um, we are now at, uh, it, it, at the hour, we're now just a little bit before seven. Um, would you have time to answer uh, a few more questions? Sarah? I would love to. That would be that would be great. I am going to ask. Um, was there any discoveries? This is from an anonymous attendee. Was there any discoveries on the history of Central Park during the excavation and renovation of Lasker Rink? Did anything turn up then? Um, that is a great question. The answer is, I do not know, but um, the Central Park Conservancy uh, has excavated and done the work. And I'm sure I could find out, or um, my email is smiller at centralparknyc.org. And if you email me to remind me to find out, I will let you know. That's very, that's very kind of you. Sarah, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a couple more questions related to uh, uh, Seneca Village. Um, this is from uh, Christopher Calateri. Any idea where the Seneca Village's owners relocated to? Did they try to stick together? 
Um, do you know if that, if that was the case? Okay, that's a great question. Um, they did not reconvene at a different place. Uh, however, um, we know Andrew Williams moved to, Queen, to Queens and there's a great deal about him uh, in the literature. Uh, we know that Elizabeth Gloucester moved to, um, moved to Brooklyn and so did Albro Lyons and Peter Guignon. Uh, they had properties downtown. Um, Simon Green uh, was a, a property owner. Uh, you know what, um, people, uh, Epiphany Davis never lived there. He lived on Broom Street. Um, people have wills. And so I've read their wills. So um, I know that many of them wound up with trust funds for their children and their children's education and um, their possessions were given to relatives. Um, some people died and their heirs got the property. Uh, there is there is a lot um, a lot of information, not a huge amount where each person went afterwards. I know a lot of people have been looking. The Institute for Seneca Village Research, I, I know it's a longer name than that, but they have a website and um, I'm sure they are doing research as well. Uh, I think, you know, the more people research, the more we'll find the afterlife of Seneca Village. What I have found in my research um, is the fact that, you know, some people took their uh, earnings, their awards, uh, more awards, and um, moved and moved. Oh, the McCollins, Elizabeth McCollin, who you saw her, um, her award page, she moved to, uh, just across to the uh, east side with her husband. She left an amazing will, very touching. No, it must have been fascinating to come across those things. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, where is the source of water for Seneca Village? This is a question from Phyllis Shanley. Okay, that's a really good question. Um, there, there were many, Central Park had many underground springs as well as uh, water bodies and, and um, rivulets. Uh, but Seneca Village, uh, there was right south of Seneca Village was the largest, most profuse spring called Dr. Tanner Spring which um, I'm gonna be writing a blog about for my website. But uh, I think the spring, because of a map that I saw, actually touched lightly on Seneca Village. So there was a profuse spring, either within the village itself or uh, very close by. But also, although I didn't see any on a map of Seneca Village, I have read many, many real estate ads throughout the, um, throughout the park and people dug wells. And I, I'm assuming that um, people in Seneca Village dug wells as well. The water is, you know, under the surface. And um, I've seen lots of real estate ads, for example, that that man, James Amory, who owned a great deal of the, you know, park a little further downtown in the 60s and, and 70s, his ads for his property talk about never failing water from his wells. But the map doesn't show it. So I can just assume that most people had a well dug. Right. Uh, are there any other traces of Native American life and design of the park? That's a question from Catherine Rochlin. A great question. Um, as far as archeologists have gone back, the answer is no, um, nothing has been found. Um, mostly you usually see shell middens the way they have an Inwood Park um, or pottery or you know, weaponry, something to indicate. To date, uh, uh, you know, other archeologists would be much more um, uh, experts on this subject, but nothing has come to date. The park for the most part was this rocky swampy land, which is why it was the common land. Nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted to live there. 
and the native um, tribes, uh, the Lenape, the native peoples, it wasn't suitable for what they wanted for their winter quarters or, or their seasonal quarters. So much was better downtown near Collect Pond, downtown. Um, for a wonderful reference, it, read Eric uh, Sanderson's Manahatta. He is the source that I use for the most part uh, about the Lenape. And I would encourage you to read it. It's just the best book. And his research is is wonderful, and he really explains the, the um, groups, where they lived, where they wanted to live, what kind of topography they really wanted, and it wasn't in Central Park. Right, thank you. I will just ask now just a, 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 few, a few more questions, uh, but one thing is, um, would you repeat your emails, Sarah? I, I will also send it out when I send out the video link for, to, um, for tonight's program. But would you mind repeating your email, Sarah, for questions? Okay, well, here's what I would really rather have um, is info at beforecentralpark.com. I mean, this is the reason I'm like, why am I giving them the Central Park email? Uh, I, you can, of course, contact me there. but. Um, what I, I actually created the website, which only went live two weeks ago, so that people with questions about the pre-park or about the book could really contact me. And it's info at beforecentralpark.com. That's where I would really love you to all to um, engage with me. Uh, I will be posting blogs. I will be having guest bloggers. I will answer your questions. I will also, if and when I find mistakes in the book, which is bound to happen, uh, I'll post that too. And so um, really please, that's the best place to find me. Right, and I also want to, I also want to mention, of course, you can purchase the book at beforecentralpark.com. Uh, you can also purchase it through um, uh, Columbia University, but if you also want to support um, the Conservancy before Central Park would be right. Great. Well, or or what before if you try to buy the book and before Central Park, it immediately leads you to the Central Park Conservancy or Columbia University uh, in order to purchase the book. And so um, you can purchase it either one. But of course, if you purchase it through the Conservancy, you're helping Central Park. I do not sell the book. But we obviously delighted to help the conservancy. Thank you. Um, okay, my the final the final uh, few questions. Um, going back to the um, wonderful uh, logs that you dis that you discovered, well, with the assistance of your your colleague, um, will they be digitized? Asked Christopher Calateri. The the payments with the, the breakdown of uh, how all the landowners were paid. In, well, um, that really I can't say, but the Municipal Archives is trying to scan whatever it can. I mean, I saw them when they were covered with mold and, and uh, they, you know, have been cared for. Um, they're, you know, they're trying to scan everything uh, that they own. So I don't know what, um, where it falls in their criteria, but that's, that's a question for the municipal archives. They're wonderful people I couldn't have written this book without them. You know, a real shout out to the, um, Pauline Tool, the commissioner and Ken Cobb, the, uh, assistant commissioner. They, they're amazing and the staff. So, um, if you're interested, I would reach out to them. Okay, this, this will be um, our final question. And I, I do apologize if I didn't get to your question. Um, I'll, uh, I'll also forward on to Sarah the questions, but as she says, the best uh, place to um, ask your question is to write to info at beforecentralpark.com. Uh, and, and that question, um, it, well, I shall ask to where, where water wells, this is Cynthia Weber, we, we talked about, um, you know, finding water. Were they recent, any found during recent arche archeological excavations? Were there any recently found? Any water? Uh, water wells. 
Water wells. Oh, no one's mentioned it to me. Right. Okay. And did the plots that have had churches on them, again, a real straight question, did they get more, uh, were they paid more than those that just had houses on them? The, the land, the houses were assessed separately. And if you had a house, you got more money because the, you had something, you had made an improvement. Um, but, you know, the, it's really hard because, um, of course, we don't know what the condition of the homes were. So we can't really tell whether they were fair assessments or not fair. I mean, they're wild, range wildly from several thousand dollars to, you know, $25 which a, a shanty, which was just a few boards and a, a pipe, not a dirt floor sometimes. I mean, the level, we don't know. So we can't say how fairly or unfairly the homes were assessed, but the land was assessed separately. And um, for the most part, they all seem to be more or less within a few dollars of each other. You know, one, one lot in the middle of the block, let's say, um, that appears to have no rock um, might be, let's just say $400 and next door it's 410. It's like, why was this one 410 and this one only 400? Can't, don't right. know. We don't have the kind of uh, thinking that went into it. All we can say for certain is that lots on avenues were more valuable lots on corners were more valuable, lots mid block were less valuable, size of the lot varied, the ones on Fifth Avenue were 25 by 120 feet, but mostly the rest of the park was 25 by 100 feet. Thank you. you know, a lot of it, it it's still, a, it's a mad, it was maddening to see or try to figure out the logic or the history from you know, 120 years ago. Well, I think you have done a remarkable job at unearthing many of the answers to these questions. And Sarah, I just want to you know, thank you so much. Your vast knowledge about this topic and the fact that the book is also illustrated with many of your beautiful photographs through your long association with Central Park. And it was so kind of you to also focus on tonight on the General Society members, which I don't think we really knew much about their role in Central Park. And I want to express our appreciation uh, to that. But, but most of all, Sarah, thank you so much for being part, a wonderful part of, of our lecture series and for giving such an outstanding presentation. Uh, Victoria, would you like to say a few words? Just to add to that, Sarah, whenever someone like you comes along, I, I think curiosity, commitment, determination, what a, you're, you give us all, all a gift when you put, to be consumed with producing this, with all of the work that's put into it, and exhaustive research, and it's so much fun to listen to you. It's just beautiful. So thank you so much for what you've produced for all of us to enjoy and understand. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It was the most fun I ever had the last seven years. I mean, sometimes frustrating, but the research, the archives in New York City, it just, you know, it, you, I time traveled back. It was just wonderful. Just the most fun. Thank you so much. Well, we are so grateful for you for sharing um, your research, your books. And I also would like to, again, I just want to mention that this amazing book is available and Margo Welshire has just has just posted it she's just ordered it so we I hope many of you will follow Margo's example um, I'm just going to mention the two up two upcoming lectures very briefly um, on Tuesday July 12th we have the history of the meatpacking district and its pioneers with Jackie Ottman and on Tuesday July 12th 19th we at again at 6 p.m. We have travelers journeys on the railroads from the early surveys to modern vacations, and this is from with the Barringer Railroad Library curator from St. Louis, and it's in tangent with um, a special exhi exhibition currently at the Grolier Club. Um, 
Thank you, our audience. Uh, thank you so much for attending tonight. But most of all, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and for really like, revealing so much about the unknown history of Central Park. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll thank say good night now. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Good night. <laughs>